In 2006, the object in our solar system known as Pluto was reclassified as a dwarf planet, having spent more than 70 years known by most as the ninth planet in our solar system. Many people were saddened by this news and expressed their feelings in different ways. But why was Pluto reclassified? What does it mean? And what does it mean for us? Today, we're going to talk about it. Let's first talk about the early history of our understanding of Pluto. Due to Pluto's small size and being so far away, it took a long time for humans to discover it. It was unable to be seen by the naked eye, unlike some of the planets in our solar system. So we needed to use telescopes and to be looking in the right place at the right time to be able to spot it. And this was a difficult task. And humanity has only possessed the technology to do so in the last couple of hundred years. Let's start in the 1840s. Urbain Le Verrier analysed the movement of Uranus and using Newtonian mechanics and mathematical formulae was able to predict that there was another planetary body out beyond Uranus that we had not yet discovered. Basically, things that have mass have gravity, and things that have gravity pull on other things that have gravity. We're sometimes able to detect when an object is being pulled by an, another object, which we don't yet know about. Le Verrier noticed that there were bumps in Uranus's orbit, which wasn't explained by all of the objects which we currently knew about, which led him to use mathematics to predict the location and eventually observe the planet which we now know as Neptune. By watching how the path deviated in Uranus's orbit, we were able to find the eighth planet, Neptune. This in and of itself is pretty cool, but as astronomers observed and mapped the movements of Uranus and Neptune over the rest of the 19th century, it didn't quite add up. It was almost as though there was another object out further which we didn't know about yet. A possible ninth planet. Planet X was what Percival Lowell named this potential planet when he set out on his quest to discover it. In 1894, Lowell founded the Lowell Observatory in Arizona in the United States, and in 1906 begun his quest to find the ninth planet, Planet X. By 1909, Lowell and his colleague William H. Pickering had identified a few potential places for Planet X to be. Unfortunately, Lowell died in 1916 before having found Planet X, although that's not actually technically true. He had captured a number of images in which Planet X was. He just didn't identify it as being the missing planet. Several years after Lowell's death, Clyde Tombaugh picked up the search and was tasked with the assignment of finding Planet X. He systematically photographed pairs of images of the sky and compared them looking for objects that had moved, objects which could potentially be Planet X. It took him about a year, but in February of 1930, he thought he found something. He was looking over images that he captured in the previous month and was able to see an object moving in the sky. After taking more confirmation images, the Harvard College Observatory was contacted and Planet X had officially been found. The next job was to name Planet X. Over a thousand entries were received and eventually it was Venetia Burney, an 11 year old girl from England who suggested Pluto, which was the name which was eventually voted on, and Planet X was now known as Pluto. Over the 20th century, we observed Pluto more and more, and we made estimations of how big it was and how massive it was. Originally, we thought that Pluto was about the same mass of Earth, but over the course of the century, our estimation was revised and became smaller and smaller and smaller. Astronomers now didn't believe that Pluto could have possibly been Planet X, for it didn't have the mass responsible for the bumps in Uranus's orbit. Hmm. Eventually, in 1992, Miles Standish used data from Voyager 2's flyby of Neptune to conclude that actually we had overestimated just a little bit 
Neptune's size. It was about 0.5% smaller than we had originally estimated, which is about the size of Mars, which if we think about that, if we do the maths, actually means that we didn't need a planet X to explain Uranus's orbit. It turns out that Pluto is pretty small. It is only 1 459th the mass of Earth. It's smaller than our moon, which is very small for a planet. Around the turn of the 21st century, astronomers were debating as to whether or not Pluto should be called a planet. We were discovering objects in Pluto's orbiting neighborhood, which were a comparable size to Pluto. We now call this era of space the Kuiper Belt. And the question was asked, should they all be called planets? On July 29, 2005, the astronomers at Caltech discovered an object now known as Aries, which was in the neighborhood of Pluto's orbit, which was more massive than Pluto. There was debate as to whether or not this was the 10th planet, and some newspapers even referred to it as such. But in actual fact, the astronomers weren't sure what to do with it. Was it a 10th planet or was it something else entirely? And if it was something else, Pluto would therefore also be something else. In August 2006, the International Astronomical Union voted to update what we called a planet. For an object in our solar system to be called a planet, it needed to meet three criteria. The first being that the object must be in orbit around the sun. The second was that the object must be massive enough to be rounded by its own gravity. And the third being that it must have cleared the neighborhood around its orbit, meaning that no objects of comparable sizes other than its natural satellites like moons would be in the area around it or in its orbit. There were plenty of objects that were a comparable size in Pluto's orbiting neighborhood. Some were even more massive, which meant that Pluto was stripped of its planetary title and was now a dwarf planet. So Pluto was no longer the ninth planet in the solar system. It was a dwarf planet and an object in the Kuiper belt. But it's still pretty cool. It has several moons. The closest and biggest, Charon, is about half the diameter of Pluto and one eighth its mass, leading to the barycenter, or the point around which they orbit, being almost a thousand kilometers above the surface of Pluto. One year for Pluto, or one full rotation of the Sun, is 248 Earth years, meaning that Pluto hasn't even made half of its trip around the Sun since humans have known about it. And it's so far away, it takes light from the Sun five and a half hours to reach Pluto. With the discovery of other objects within Pluto's neighborhood, we had to update our understanding of what Pluto was. This is a part of scientific understanding. When we learn new things, we need to adjust our current understandings to make sure that it fits with all of the evidence that we have. And this is not the first time that humans have adapted our definition of what a planet is. In the second century, Claudius Ptolemy referred to the seven wanderers of the sky as planets. These were the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, not Earth. The sun and the moon later were revised as not being planets for obvious reason. And eventually the earth was added as we understood that earth orbited the sun. Later we added more planets when we spotted them through telescopes. Uranus can't be spotted with the naked eye, neither can Neptune. And so we added them to our understanding of planets later on. Claudius Ptolemy also referred to the objects that didn't wander across the sky as fixed stars. And it turns out, as we found out more about the galaxy and the universe, that these stars weren't fixed either. They were all spinning around in their own galaxies and were all moving throughout the universe. It's not even the first time that we downgraded an object which we once called a planet. Ceres is an object which is in the asteroid belt. We discovered it between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, and for a while it was referred to as a planet. But as we discovered more and more objects in its neighborhood, we downgraded it from planet to asteroid. And later, when the IAU updated their definition of a planet, it was then given the title of dwarf planet. 
What's the point of this video? Well, I wanted to say a little bit about the history of our understanding of Pluto. But also, and my bigger point is that it's good to change our minds when we need to. It's important, in fact, and it's scientific. When we gain new insights and new knowledge, our understandings and our opinions might need to change to be able to accommodate our new learnings, our new evidence, and this new understanding. As new discoveries are made, we adjust our understanding so that it is more accurate. We are constantly learning more about the world around us and the universe. And as we learn more, our understanding of that changes and knowledge needs to be updated. And this I think is also true for our lives. We encounter new things, new ideas, new understandings, and our opinions might need to be updated. And that's okay, there's no problem in updating your understanding of the world so that it fits better your experiences and what you know. As citizens of the world, we should make sure that we are keeping an eye on our opinions, checking them against our experiences, what we know, who we've met, and make sure they are the most accurate and the most kind. It is a scientific thing to be able to change our mind when presented with new and more accurate information. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you have enjoyed it and you came away with something that you learned, something that you found interesting and perhaps even a sense of wonder about how we make sense of the world and the universe. If you enjoyed this video, I'd love to know in the comments below and with that like button and make sure you're subscribed to That's Pretty Cool so that you don't miss any future videos where I delve into topics such as this one. And as you go, ask questions, be curious and don't be afraid to change your mind. Take care and I'll see you next time.